I hope you have already read the passage that I sent you yesterday. It is a very interesting passage and as I told you, it is a bit difficult, uh, but please do attempt it very carefully and try to submit it uh, before the weekend so that I can check it and return it back to you. Now please, once again, come back to the writing skill. I have shared so many things already with you, how to write uh, an impressive story, but there are so many other things which you have to keep in your mind uh, before. How to improve your writing skill. And I think I told you that our reading exposure is very, very important because they say we write what we read. Consciously or unconsciously, we are influenced, we learn a lot from great writers. For example, the, the story that we read last week, The Necklace by Mupasan, you might have seen, there are so many beauties of that story. Number one, it begins abruptly. A situation is set up, set up and the writer doesn't waste any time. He starts building the character of the main character, our protagonist, uh, Mathilda, right in the very first paragraph. He throws light on her life, present life, how she is suffering because of poverty in the, uh, in the house. Then, other features of her character. She is very uh, romantic, ambitious. She wants to live a life uh, full of luxury. She wants to be admired, to be adored, etc. Uh, and as far as the language is concerned, you might have seen that the writer is highly, highly skillful. Although it is a translation, it was written in French, but it has been translated by so many people. And I think uh, the version we sent you, it was a simple one. It was not standard translation because uh, it is a bit difficult. Now, another thing that you might have noticed, the, the suspense how the suspense in that story was created. We do, the reader doesn't know what is going to happen. He only focuses on the events that are happening in the life of the protagonist, how she is suffering, how she is uh, so much ambitious and how she gets an opportunity to have some good time. But that few hours of good time turn out to be a life full of misery, full of hardships, full of difficulties. And then what happened in the, what transpires in the end that it was there, it was her fate it was undeserved suffering. <clears throat> now please listen, another beauty of the great writers is that whenever they want to highlight the emotion, the feeling, the situation, they use language in a repetitive way. For example, uh, there was a sentence, she had no luxury, no, so the repetition of no makes her, uh, you may say, the situation very, very strong. Okay, and today 
once again as you will be reading a great story once again by a great writer oscar wilde i promise you that you will be reading today uh, the happy prince apparently it is a very simple story but it is full of meaning there is irony uh, the character of uh, uh, the bird is very meaningful and the relationship between the dead prince and the swallow is very very meaningful and how the writer has described different elements of human behavior uh, that is worth reading and worth focusing now some more points about <clears throat> story writing first of all we were talking about reading reading is very very important in improving not only our knowledge but also our understanding comprehension our language skill our vocabulary our use of punctuation correct using punctuation correctly and it was for this reason i told you that focus on how the writer is using direct speech or dialogue and once again today i advise you to look at the punctuation used by the writer now another thing when we read when we read from another culture from another religion this not only improves our knowledge but it also makes us see life through the eyes of another person we see another culture and by the end of the day we realize that problems of social life poverty suffering crime uh, oppression disease all are universal whether it is america or pakistan people go through great hardships if they are poor okay and one more thing when we read about another culture uh, our impression our prejudice our prior idea about another culture is generally proved mistaken so the greatest advantage the greatest reward of reading international culture is that our wall of prejudice is brought down it is it is brought down and we begin to see life universally now <clears throat> right of uh, please writing is some of the very difficult things for a student and even for a teacher writing is difficult because there are so many reasons number 1 you have to concentrate you not only have to think seriously you also have to concentrate you have to cut yourself off other attractions for example nowadays young people have so many other attractions they cannot simply cut themselves off other attractions and one more thing whenever we are writing it gives us so many rewards number 1 we learn about ourselves our ability our skill the the level of our mental approach okay and this is for this reason 
that whenever we write something, for example, you sit down and you want to write a piece of poetry, you will see that out of yourselves. And what happens next? Whenever, for example, you want to vent out your emotions, your feelings, your understanding about your society, you will see you are never satisfied. For example, you write one paragraph and after finishing it, what will happen? You will read it and you will, by the end of the, uh, by the end, you will have the feeling that this is not very impressive and you want to revise it. And you will crumple the paper into a ball and throw it away and write again. And this is one of the facts that all the great writers, all the great poets, they have revised their work again and again, again and again, again and again, perhaps dozens of times. And only then something close to perfection is produced. So writing is very, very creative. It is a process that involves, that uses everything in your mind and in your heart. For example, if you want to write a poem about the suffering of people in Syria, you will see that you start with some emotions, some feeling. Maybe uh, you are hurt, you are so sorry, you are so unhappy, but it is very likely when the whole procedure goes through the process of writing the poem or something, uh, you may say, expression of your views, you will be crying. There are so many writers who, while they are writing, they cry because there is so much suffering. If you have seen what, is, what has happened in Karachi in recent days, if you have a feeling heart, you will be greatly, greatly upset. Just imagine when the water rises up to the main gate of your beautiful home. What can you do? Nothing. Nothing in the beautiful house can be saved. And there is also threat. Then there is so much actually to talk about. And then pay attention to the point of view. By point of view, we mean whether you are writing in first person or third person. The stories which, which have the wording, which includes the word you, what you did. Naturally, it will be a first person narrative. But uh, when you decide, when it is an open question, then you can use both or any of the point of view, first person, third person. Then something has to happen in your story. Now please listen. Uh, some in, important event in the story is very important because this whole story will go around it. For example, if it was the necklace, an event happened, something very, very important happened. The lady lost the necklace, okay? Then show, don't tell. Whenever we are writing narrative, a narrative, a story, narration and explanation or description, they go together. And the examiner is actually 
advising that just do not tell. For example, if you want to say how somebody was crying, you write, she was crying, okay? But if you show how she was crying, okay? So there are so many different ways, so many different beautiful expressions that can be used. And one expression you read in the story, the necklace, two large tears. So this shows, for example, if you want to say somebody was very, very sad, you can use the metaphor. For example, you can say uh, she was crestfallen. It is a beautiful expression. Crestfallen means when somebody, it is actually uh, taken from uh, the body language of animals, sorry, birds. It is taken from the body language of birds. When they are sick, their crest goes down. And we use the expression crest falling. So show, do not simply tell. Then do not introduce too many characters. Always uh, restrict yourselves to two or three characters. If you, you actually, your canvas, your limit is, your task is very limited. You just have to produce about 500 words. Therefore, if you in introduce more characters, your plot will weaken. You won't be able to uh, explore your character fully and the plot will also be affected. Then start as close to the climax as possible. And I previously I told you that how to begin a story. And I told you one of the most effective and quick method of being in the theme of the narrative or the story is to begin with action. Introduce your character doing something. And in this way, your story will start in the very first line and you will be very close to the main theme or the main hook or climax of the story. Do not waste your words on unnecessary details or introduction. Uh, and then do not worry about vocabulary using it. Now please listen, uh, this is one of the, uh, you may say very serious thing that your vocabulary that you use in the narrative of your writing should be active vocabulary and you should be very comfortable with those words. You should know not only the meaning, but also the grammar and usage of the word. If you have just learned the word from a thesaurus and you are using it, you can go wrong. It can create a very, very bad impact in, on your writing. And I can uh, relate an example. Uh, there was a student uh, who got 10 A stars, sorry, eight A stars and one C, and that C was in English. And the parents were greatly worried, very upset. They got the paper recheck and the examiner made a comment on his writing flawed ambition that the candidate was very ambitious. He used lofty words, but his ambition was flawed. It means it went wrong. So please using a dictionary is useful when you are studying, when you are reading, but not useful when you are writing. So that's enough for today. 
uh, now you are going to read the story. I hope you will enjoy it and you are going to learn a lot from it. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joy Chan. The Happy Prince and Other Tales by Oscar Wilde. The Happy Prince. High above the city, on a tall column, stood the statue of the Happy Prince. He was gilded all over with thin leaves of fine gold. For eyes, he had two bright sapphires, and a large red ruby glowed on his sword hilt. He was very much admired indeed. He is as beautiful as a weathercock, remarked one of the town councillors who wished to gain a reputation for having artistic tastes. Only not quite so useful, he added, fearing lest people should think him unpractical, which he really was not. Why can't you be like the happy prince? asked the sensible mother of her little boy, who was crying for the moon. The happy prince never dreams of crying for anything. I'm glad there's someone in the world who is quite happy muttered a disappointed man as he gazed at the wonderful statue. He looks just like an angel, said the charity children, as they came out of the cathedral in their bright scarlet cloaks and their clean white pinafores. How do you know, said the mathematical master, you have never seen one. Ah, but we have in our dreams, answered the children, and the mathematical master frowned and looked very severe for he did not approve of children dreaming. One night there flew over the city a little swallow. His friends had gone away to Egypt six weeks before, but he had stayed behind, for he was in love with the most beautiful reed. He had met her early in the spring as he was flying down the river after a big yellow moth, and had been so attracted by her slender waist that he had stopped. This was his courtship, and it lasted all through the summer. It is a ridiculous attachment, tweeted the other swallows. She has no money, and far too many relations. And indeed, the river was quite full of reeds. Then, when the autumn came, they all flew away. After they had gone, he felt lonely, and began to tire of his lady love. She has no conversation, he said, and I am afraid that she is a coquette for she is always flirting with the wind, and certainly whenever the wind blew, the reed made the most graceful curtsies. I admit that she is domestic, he continued, but I love traveling, and my wife, consequently, should love traveling also. Will you come away with me, he said finally to her, but the reed shook her head. She was so attached to her home. You have been trifling with me, he cried. I am off to the pyramids. Goodbye. And he flew away. All day long he flew, and at night time he arrived at the city. Where shall I put up, he said. I hope the town has made preparations. Then he saw the statue on the tall column. I will put up there, he cried. It is a fine position, with plenty of fresh air. So he alighted just between the feet of the happy prince. I have a golden bedroom, he said softly to himself as he looked around, 
and he prepared to go to sleep. But just as he was putting his head under his wing, a large drop of water fell on him. What a curious thing, he cried. There is not a single cloud in the sky, and the stars are quite clear and bright, and yet it is raining. The climate in the north of Europe is really dreadful. Marie used to like the rain, but that was merely her selfishness. Then another drop fell. What is the use of a statue if it cannot keep the rain off, he said. I must look for a good chimney pot, and he determined to fly away. But before he had opened his wings, a third drop fell, and he looked up and saw. Ah, what did he see? The eyes of the happy prince were filled with tears, and tears were running down his golden cheeks. His face was so beautiful in the moonlight that the little swallow was filled with pity. Who are you, he said. I am the happy prince. Why are you weeping then, asked the swallow. You have quite drenched me. When I was alive and had a human heart, answered the statue, I did not know what tears were, for I lived in the palace of San Suchi, where sorrow is not allowed to enter. In the daytime I played with my companions in the garden, and in the evening I led the dance in the great hall. Round the garden ran a very lofty wall, but I never cared to ask what lay beyond it. Everything about me was so beautiful. My courtiers called me the happy prince, and happy indeed I was, if pleasure be happiness. So I lived and so I died. And now that I am dead, they have set me up here so high that I can see all the ugliness and all the misery of my city. And though my heart is made of lead, yet I cannot choose but weep. What? Is he not solid gold? said the swallow to himself. He was too polite to make any personal remarks out loud. Far away, continued the statue in a low musical voice. Far away in a little street, there is a poor house. One of the windows is open, and through it I can see a woman seated at a table. Her face is thin and worn, and she has coarse red hands, all pricked by the needle, for she is a seamstress. She is embroidering passion flowers on a satin gown for the loveliest of the queen's maids of honour to wear at the next court ball. In a bed in the corner of the room, the little boy is lying ill. He has a fever and is asking for oranges. His mother has nothing to give him but river water, so he is crying. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, will you not bring her the ruby out of my sword hilt? My feet are fastened to this pedestal and I cannot move. I am waited for in Egypt, said the swallow. My friends are flying up and down the Nile and talking to the large lotus flowers. Soon they will go to sleep in the tomb of the great king. The king is there himself in his painted coffin. He is wrapped in yellow linen and embalmed with spices. Round his neck is a chain of pale green jade and his hands are like withered leaves. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me for one night and be my messenger? The boy is so thirsty and the mother so sad. I don't think I like boys, answered the swallow. Last summer when I was staying on the river, there were two rude boys, the miller's sons, who were always throwing stones at me. They never hit me, of course. We swallows fly far too well for that. And besides, I come of a family famous for its agility. But still, it was a mark of disrespect. But the happy prince looked so sad that the little swallow was sorry. It is very cold here, he said, but I will stay with you for one night and be your messenger. Thank you, little swallow, said the prince. So the swallow picked out the great ruby from the prince's sword and flew away with it in his beak over the roofs of the town. He passed by the cathedral tower, where the white marble angels were sculptured. He passed by the palace and heard the sound of dancing. A beautiful girl came out on the balcony with her lover. How wonderful the stars are, he said to her, and how wonderful is the power of love. I hope my dress will be ready in time for the state ball, she answered. 
I've ordered passion flowers to be embroidered on it, but the seamstresses are so lazy. He passed over the river and saw the lanterns hanging to the masts of the ships. He passed over the ghetto and saw the old Jews bargaining with each other and weighing out money in copper scales. At last he came to the poorhouse and looked in. The boy was tossing feverishly on his bed, and the mother had fallen asleep. She was so tired. In he hopped and laid the great ruby on the table beside the woman's thimble. Then he flew gently round the bed, fanning the boy's forehead with his wings. How cool I feel, said the boy. I must be getting better. And he sank into a delicious slumber. Then the swallow flew back to the happy prince and told him what he had done. It is curious, he remarked, but I feel quite warm now, although it is so cold. That is because you have done a good action, said the prince. And the little swallow began to think, and then he fell asleep. Thinking always made him sleepy. When day broke, he flew down to the river and had a bath. What a remarkable phenomenon, said the professor of ornithology as he was passing over the bridge. A swallow in winter, and he wrote a long letter about it to the local newspaper. Everyone quoted it. It was full of so many words that they could not understand. Tonight I go to Egypt, said the swallow, and he was in high spirits at the prospect. He visited all the public monuments and sat a long time on top of the church steeple. Wherever he went, the sparrows chirped and said to each other, What a distinguished stranger! And so he enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. Have you any commissions for Egypt, he cried. I am just starting. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? I am waited for in Egypt, answered the swallow. Tomorrow my friends will fly up to the second cataract, the river horse coaches there among the bulrushes. And on a great granite throne sits the god Memnon. All night long he watches the stars. And when the morning star shines, he utters one cry of joy. And then he is silent. At noon, the yellow lions come down to the water's edge to drink. They have eyes like green barrels. And their roar is louder than the roar of the cataract. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away across the city, I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over a desk covered with papers, and in a tumbler by his side there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are red as a pomegranate, and he has large and dreamy eyes. He is trying to finish a play for the director of the theatre, but he is too cold to write any more. There is no fire in the grate, and hunger has made him faint. I will wait with you one night longer, said the swallow who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now, said the prince. My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires, which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck out one of them and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweler and buy food and firewood and finish his play. Dear prince, said the swallow, I cannot do that. And he began to weep. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Do as I command you. So the swallow plucked out the prince's eye and flew away to the student's garret. It was easy enough to get in as there was a hole in the roof. Through this he darted and came into the room. The young man had his 